We're here in Columbus, Ohio, and we are going to talk today about how to write, publish, and launch your book in 2018. Some of you here are probably authors. I'll have to tell you, I always had a dream of being an author, but let me ask first, because we're in December, and we're looking at business plans, we're looking at personal plans for the next year. How many of you have done New Year's resolutions, whether you're online or whether you're here personally? New Year's resolutions? Okay. I was looking at the statistics. Do you know that literally only 9.8% of New Year's resolutions actually come to fruition? And why is that? I'll tell you why. It's because we have dreams and goals, but we do not have a process that's going to put that through into place, right? So today we're going to talk about a process. Real quick personal story. I have been looking at this process for quite some time, for over a couple of years. Like I said, I always wanted to be an author. It was never a New Year's resolution because again, I don't really believe in those. However, I have been looking and thinking, when is my time? When is my place? Is it gonna be 2017, 2018? And as I've been watching, there's been a specific process and I know that Carrie's gonna speak about it today so I won't steal his thunder. But I've been looking and watching other authors and other people, some of you in this room, some of you online, I've been peeking through and wondering, okay, is this what I should be doing? And I'll tell you what, back in August, I went ahead and I delved into that process and it is amazing. So I can't wait for you to learn more about this and I'm gonna go ahead without further ado, please help me welcome our Chief Igniter, Carrie Oberbrunner. Awesome. So you guys, you guys ready for some fun today? Yeah. Yeah, yeah? awesome. Well look, it's great to be here with you in person. It's great to be online as well. I'd love for you, if you're online, to type in where you're from. That would be fantastic. Because we get people from all over the world, it's fun to, uh, to see where people are from. So how many of you have written a book? Raise your hand. Anybody? Okay, how many of you th are thinking about someday writing a book? Go like this, go like this. All right, little waves, okay waves of inspiration. Well look, we are going to be talking about how to do this in the next year. I don't know about you guys, but I am a futurist to, to a fault. It comes with blessings and curses, okay? Is anybody else here like stuck in the future at all? Anybody? Okay. So I'm always thinking about what's next. I'm always planning. I'm always prepping. So I'm already living in 2018 and I know that's a bad thing at times because it's like, hey dude, it's 2017, you got a few weeks left, and the only thing we can control is the present. I told my son the other day, that's why it's called present, because it's a gift, right? And he kind of thought that was funny. He laughed, even though you didn't, that's okay. <laughs> there you go, thank you. But, but, you know, I told Keegan, like, dude, like, all you can do is right now. And so literally, today, you can make a decision to change your future. And we're gonna be talking all about that I am the Chief Igniter, David Branderhorst is my business partner. He's doing um, a lot with Business Academy Elite, which we're gonna be launching publicly in 2018, so be ready. We're gonna do a public launch, and it talks all about Facebook ads, and funnels, and avatars, and email lists, and all kind membership sites, all kinds of the business stuff. And David's gonna be uh, talking about that in 2018. But today, we're talking about how to become an author. And I wanna, I wanna ask you for a favor, okay? I have some gifts today, in fact, right up here. So I'm gonna ask you guys, our goal in 2020, and you guys know what this is, you've, you've heard me beat this drum for about two years, and believe it or not, with all the metrics, we're actually getting closer to that number. So we can see how many views we have, we can see how much it, people we're impacting, we can see our authors, and seeing how much their books are selling and reaching other people. So we're getting closer on this number for the next two years and it's very exciting. But I wanna ask you guys if you can share this live stream right now. If you're, if you're here in the room or if you're in uh, online, if you can share this, tag somebody who needs to be watching this about authors, about publishing. And in fact, I have a few gifts for those who do that. Um, Erica's got a gift that she'll give you on the ebook, but I can't ship these books everywhere. So, for those of you who did it here in the room, um, I have 
one of our authors, Amy Schmidauer, Vlog Like a Boss. It, it launched in January, and it's still a number one bestseller today, after 11 months. So if anybody shared that in the room, raise your hand, and I will give you a signed copy. Did anybody do that? Brenda, awesome, fantastic, look at you. And if you already have one, pass it along. Anybody else in the room? We got one left. One left. Anybody? Joel, do you already have one? Do you already have one? I'm gonna give one to Adam. Because Adam, Adam like is somewhat to blame. You ready? You ready, buddy? All right. Adam is somewhat to blame for this whole thing. And Adam, come on up here, buddy. I gotta quick tell the story. Come on up here. Listen. You guys that know this is happening. It's all weird. No, it's all good. But listen, I gotta tell this story because I wrote about it in one of the books. It might have been Deeper Path. But true story, uh, we were at the Starbucks at Powell Road and Sawmill. Do you remember this? And look, I gotta give God all the credit here. But we were meeting and you were talking about what? Like your future? Yeah. You yeah. were at you were at Lazy Boy. I was, I was an independent contractor for Lazy Boy. Okay. Future. And your kids were a lot younger or even not born? Uh, one was born and yeah, that was it. Okay. We have two now. So. Okay, and I'm telling this story because it all relates to books actually. I had just finished the Deeper Path book, but I was traditionally published, which means that the traditional publisher was gonna hold on to it for like eight months to do edits and all this stuff. And I'm listening to Adam share about his vision and his choices and his kids and not wanting to take a promotion because you'd have to travel a lot, right, remember right. this? Yep. And I'm listening to all this and I'm like, well gee, you know what? I'm gonna invent something up on the spot, okay? Now, I, I didn't say that in my head, but I, I- I didn't know that. He didn't know that. <laughs> but I knew a guy was in pain and he wanted clarity, and I said, I'll tell you what, Adam, I'm starting this thing called the Deeper Path Coaching Cohort, and it's 10 weeks long, and literally, folks, this is how it happened. So, I'm letting you in on a little secret, okay? If someone is in front of you and you can help them, and they have a need, you need to offer it. True, right? So what happened that day? Yeah, I got some clarity, got excited. His passion was contagious. And like I said, I didn't know he was making it up on the spot, but I just kind of <laughs> felt it. Uh, and I, I said, yeah, I'm definitely interested. You're definitely interested. So I probably got out to the car, because again, me, self-limiting beliefs, you know, I had my own day job, who can I help? You, you guys get this? Do we all feel this? Let's be honest, right? And so here's a guy that I knew that needed help, and so I made up that Deeper Path Coaching Cohort on the spot, because I'm like, I'm not gonna let the publisher just sit with it for eight months and not help people. Then I called David in the car, and I, I don't know, I probably said, David, like, we're starting a coaching group, and get ready. And then, get this true story, I drove, yeah. I drove five doors down to my financial planner, David Williams. And I said, hey David, I know this is weird, I'm dropping in, but I, I want you to join the, something called the Deeper Path Coaching Cohort. And he joined. So I was two for two. That's where we met. That's where we met. And then, and yeah, because we didn't have a location. And this just happened, folks. And so what I'm saying is, the book didn't just stay a book. Do you get that? The model you're gonna learn today is that your book is not just a book. Your book is a movement. Your book is a business. And so you were one of the first people to join the Deeper Path Coaching Cohort. How many of you in the room actually have gone through that process? Raise your hand. Okay, so you all need to thank him after, okay? <laughs> so thank you for saying yes all those yeah. years ago. Thank you awesome. for creating it on the spot. And your business now today? Yeah, so uh, I'm a uh, co-founder of a, a company called Vision Spark. And Vision we, Spark. Uh, help company, we help companies hire better. Yeah, and so you, you find people who need jobs, uh, you place them with high-level companies that want superstars. Exactly. Right? Okay, yeah. fantastic. You notice the brand too, Vision thank Spark? You. Get it, get spark, igniting souls. See, it's a, it, it makes, it matches. Okay, so why do I share all that? Because listen, there's several lessons right in there. Number one, your book is a business. Number two, you don't need to wait for your book to be published yet. Did you catch that? Some of you are thinking, well, gee, you know, you gotta write the book, then that's gonna take several months, then you gotta go publish it, then you create a coaching program around it. Not at all. Once you have enough clarity about your book, you can literally start creating products and services around that book. Cool? 
Make sense? All right, Rick, you're in the room. I know you've spoken about your book and it's not even released yet, but you're in process. That's right. And I've heard you speak a number of times on that topic. So listen, if I am a coach and if I had to give one piece of advice to any client of mine and they were saying, what should I do in 2018? Not just because, ooh, I love books, but I would honestly tell them that the one thing that has unlocked the door for my future is writing, publishing, and marketing that book the right way. Books have literally opened doors, and you're gonna hear about this in a moment, but like TV interviews, podcast interviews, Amy's book that I passed out, she doubled her speaking fees the moment her book came out, and people didn't even blink. In fact, she told me that she lost some speaking gigs in the past because she didn't have a book. They would hold up one speaker in a little room and, and vote on the next speaker, and they'd say, well, this one has a book, this one doesn't, and she lost certain gigs because she didn't have a book. There's something about a book that gives you credibility. In fact, Brian, come up here, Brian. You don't know I'm doing this either. Come on up, Brian. Let's give Brian a hand. Listen, Brian just came up to me and, before we started, and I didn't, I didn't say I'd share it, but I said, if I share it, can I share it? So I got permission here, but you just shared that you got your first, not your first check, but you got a check mm -hmm. for your speaking fee, yeah. and your book is called Sometimes It Does Take a Brain Surgeon? Right. Okay. So check this out, folks, right? Brian, you all know him, right? Some of you know him, right? We, we, we grew up with this kid, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> now, check out what happened. What, what, what was the check you just got in the mail? I got a check for $1,500. Okay, and that's but half? Only half. And that's half. So he get, he's speaking, check this out. Where are you speaking? Ohio Health. Ohio Health, for how long? 45 minutes. 45 minutes and they hired him to speak on a topic related to his book, and he's getting $3,000. Isn't that crazy? I mean, now, are you gonna give me some of that? No. Okay. <laughs> but listen, wife wants it. your wife wants it. Your wife's like, finally, we're, we're getting all this money, right, for, for your hard work. But listen, folks, you know, let's be honest. How many people in the world get paid $3,000 for less than an hour's work. It's crazy. But you wrote the book, how did they find you? Uh, through a friend okay. uh, that knows my story and she you know, contacted the guy, it's a, called a Neuroscience Symposium. A so Neuroscience Symposium. Yeah, so now, now here's, hold on, here's all the haters in, in our head, right? What do you know about a neuroscience <laughs> symposium, right? I mean, don't we, don't we have self-limiting beliefs inside of us? Like, well, who's going to be there, right? Yeah. There'll be like 600 people will be there uh, to hear my story and to learn more about how I've been able to do this. Do this. Yeah. Overcome your brain tumor. Yeah. Overcome my, overcome my brain tumor. Yeah. Uh, my self-limiting beliefs. Uh, how I've been able to. Um, uh, overcome adversity, see through my blind spots, and have a clear vision for my life. Fantastic. That is what the deeper path started me on cool. four years ago. Adam, I thank you for doing <laughs> that because that is awesome. That whole thing. That <coughs> cool. and well, listen, I'm excited. It's funny when your students are more successful than you. Let's just be honest. He's given a TED talk. You guys know that? I mean, this is what happens. And listen, if you're not comfortable with your students outperforming you, you better quit. Because there are students, Erica's filming today, Erica's gotten asked twice back to a Barnes & Noble. I never gotten asked back, okay? <laughs> so all I'm saying is like, as coaches, as igniters, your students are gonna outperform you. And I love it. I absolutely love it. So congratulations. Thank Super you. proud of yeah. you, man. Thanks. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Listen, we're going to talk today how success can literally be created from a book. It truly can. And it's not just, ooh, he's got a physical book. By the way, are, they, are you able to sell any there? Um, they haven't determined that yet, but I, I sold 50 at the last one that I did. Sold 50 books in, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So listen, folks, it's not just, ooh, I have a physical product. 
I think every author in the room would agree that you start the book and you are this type of person, and then you finish the book and you're a new person. Do you guys agree? I mean, I've never written one of my seven books without having a major change in the process. Absolutely. It's a transformational process. Doing a book the right way provides you with freedom to go as you please, finances to earn as you wish, and fulfillment to live as you like. It really does. Now, not all books are created equal. We're gonna talk about that because certain books I'm sure you've been handed at networking events and you turn it over and it's got six different fonts and fuzzy images and there's seven typos on the back and it feels like, you know, super cheap. Has anyone ever been handed one of those at a networking event? Come on, let's be honest, right? All right, that's the only thing worse than having no book, is having a bad book, okay? So having a bad book is a bad thing, but having a good book will literally propel your business. In fact, most authors don't know how to write, publish, and market their books the right way. Instead, they spend a lot of time and money doing it the wrong way. So we're gonna talk about this today. What is the right way to publish? What is the wrong way? Erica, online, where are our guests from today? Where do we have people from? We've got Texas, Canada, Florida, Colorado. Awesome. Lots of cool states I wanna visit, right? <laughs> Instead of 18 degree Ohio today, right? But it's all good, it's all good. Fantastic. Well listen, today I'm gonna to give you guys some really cool things. In fact, I've never given this teaching just like this today uh, before. I was up finishing it um, early this morning, right? Um, because I have three kids and it's quiet at 5.30 a.m. with your little fire right there. So I'm gonna give you guys a proven model for writing the right way. I'm gonna show you how to overcome writer's block. I'm gonna show you how to discover your target audience and I'm gonna show you how to find the time to finish your book. How many of us have heard, well I would write a book but I don't have the time? Have we ever heard this or said this, right? Well listen, single mom with five kids, right? <coughs> Busy dad with, with three kids and I wrote the first five books while I had a day job, or the first four books, I should say. So look, you can find the time. In the back, Pat Gano, 83 years old, found the time to do it, right, Pat? Right. Awesome, her release is January 13th, global release. Right. It's called The Language of Heaven, <clears throat> The Language of Heaven, awesome. We're gonna show you guys a proven model for publishing the right way. If you just publish on CreateSpace, you will never be in a brick and mortar bookstore. You will not be in Barnes and Noble. I'm gonna talk about how certain things will automatically keep you out of Barnes and Noble and how certain things will get you in, okay? We're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna to talk about how do you earn the most profit and how can you distribute around the world. And then lastly, I'm gonna show you about launching your book the right way. How to do a podcast, blog, media tour, how to launch with a team of hundreds of people, even if you're a brand spanking new to social media. A lot of our authors are new to social media. They don't understand all the you know, bells and whistles. They don't have a huge platform, but they still launch in a major way and get big endorsers to support you. Those of you who are part of the Ignited Souls tribe, which means um, our private clients, did you see how many people launched their book this week? Wasn't that crazy? I mean, I'm just gonna try to go stream of consciousness here and think about all the people. But we had Pat Luce, we had Aaron Luce, so father and son, we had Tiffany Godfrey, right? We had Darlene Kinchin, right? Um, who else did we have this week? I know we had a lot. We had Kelly Renee Baker um, launched last week. Gee, I know there's probably three or four more, that's why I wanted to stop while I was going, but does anyone know any other ones? Debbie Major. Laura Shortbridge launched, right? Unipreneur book, absolutely. So it was fantastic. I mean, think about that. You know, five or six or seven in one week. Uh, it's super powerful. So look, let's jump right in. How do you overcome writer's block? You guys ready? You ready to take some notes? Yeah. All right, here we go. Um, the reason why most people have writer's block is because the, the, the model is, Think about writing a book and building a house. Would anybody go to Lowe's and Home Depot and say to the service person, I'm here, I'm ready to build my house. Um, where is your hammer? Where is your nail? Where is your plywood? 
Okay, what would happen if you would say that to the male or female in the lumber aisle? What do you think? Besides getting laughed out. Besides getting laughed out, right? It's crazy. No one would build a house with just saying, I, I don't have any idea. I don't have any plans. I'm just going to grab a hammer and a, and a nail. That's what most people do when they write their book. Most people, when they write their book, they have zero plan, and they say, computer screen, coffee, here I go. And that's, and I'll tell you what happens. I know what happens, because I've seen this happen with thousands of people. What happens is, the, the screen is a mirror. The screen becomes a mirror, and you start staring into the screen, and you look back at yourself, and what begins to come into your head? Doubt, right? Let's let's just get real personal here. You, this is somebody else. This isn't you, but you know other people. What do you think are the exact words that come, besides swear words? What are the exact <laughs> words that come into people's heads? What 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 phrases come into people's heads? What am I doing? What am I doing? It's too hard. It's too hard. Who would read this? Who would read this? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? All right, all right. I'm starting to feel. You know, a little bit hot here because, right? I mean, we all say this, right? We all feel this way, and that's what happens when you don't enter the process with a certain tool I'm going to teach you in just a moment. I've had this happen. I mean, even, even authors who've written half a dozen books, they go to write their next one, and they still feel this way. Well, we know that if you go build a house, you need what? What do we call it? A blueprint. A blueprint. Before you ever get a hammer, before you ever get a nail, you pay an architect and they make drawings and you have what's called a proposal. In fact, without writing a book without a map is like building a house without a blueprint. Okay? Writing a book without a map is like building a house without a blueprint. The reason why our authors succeed and succeed well is because we invite them into a process called a what? It starts with a P. What do we have them write first? A proposal. a proposal. And many people say, well, why would I write a proposal if I already know I'm, I'm going to write a book or if I'm going to self-publish a book? Or why would I ever do that? I'll tell you why you would do that. Because when you write your proposal, it's like literally saying, where are the walls going to go? Where are the rooms going to go? What's the elevation on the lot? All these things that are so critical happen in the <clears throat> proposal process. So before you just start writing a book, you say, who's going to read this? Who's my target audience? What's the USP, the unique selling proposition? There's another section of the proposal called your comparative analysis, which is easy to do if you know the steps, but it's what other books are out there that are like mine, and how is mine similar, and how is mine different? Once you go through the proposal process, you literally no longer have a blank screen. In fact, what you do is you reduce your book into one sentence, pretty cool, and that one sentence becomes the driver for the entire rest of the book. So it's like at the tip of the iceberg. You have a title, a working title we call it, and then you begin to put structure around it. Chapter titles, chapter summaries, two to three sentences. And literally, after I go through a proposal process, I feel so much more clear and comfortable and confident. Does this make sense so far? All right. Pat, was writing a proposal uh, a hard process, though? Yeah. It was, right? But once you had your proposal done, was writing your book easier? Absolutely. I was hoping. Oh my gosh. I was like, okay, come on, Pat. Hook me up, Pat. Hook me up. All right. But yeah, right? This is true. And Renee, you're working on your proposal right now. And you've said several times along the way, like, hey, you know, what? Am I doing this part right? Am I doing that part right? But in our program, I give you sample proposals. I even give you Nicholas Sparks' proposal who wrote the notebook. Isn't that crazy? And I give you Andy Andrews' proposal. Who, who wrote The Traveler's Gift. I give you all kinds of proposals and I say, here's what makes a good proposal, here's how to do it, here's how to follow the process. So that when you go to write your book, you already have all that stuff thought through. Here's what else we do. We talk about 
a module called mind fields. And all the grammar people in the room, they always stop me and they say, dude, you spelled it wrong. Okay, no, I spelled it the right way for me, okay? Because here's what I know. You will blow yourself up. You will blow yourself up with self-limiting beliefs. And the self-limiting beliefs are always around two lies. You ready? You guys know what these two lies are, anybody? I know that. Renee, Renee knows them. Uh, <laughs> two common minefields. I am not enough, and I don't have enough. Think about that. That's the drivers for most people's thought process all day long. I am not enough. I'm not enough in my looks. I'm not enough in my talents. I'm not enough in my education. Or I don't have enough. I don't have enough connections. I don't have enough high influential people. I don't have enough media relations. This is where we stop. In other words, we call this, hang with me, we call this BS. All right, now hang on. Belief system. This is your belief system screaming loud, saying you do not have enough, you are not enough. And you let your BS, your belief system, influence you, okay? Now write this down, this is a tweet, Joel, you ready? We don't get what we want, we get who we are. Ouch, don't you hate it when the truth hurts? I do. We don't get what we want, we get who we are. So if you say you want to write a book, say you want to be an author, say you want to get a paid three thousand dollars for an honorarium, right? Mike Clevenger in the room met you five years ago as well. You just came up to me and said you've been building your escape plan. Yep. Come on up here, Mike. Let's right, get Mike Ann. Yeah. Hey, listen, I didn't say it, but I heard a female say you lost weight. And is this true? That is true. Well, congratulations. Look yeah. at you. Look Let at me you. stand this way. <laughs> <laughs> stand right here for the for the sure. online audience. So I met you about five years ago. Right. And Dave, David and I, um, I think we were all driving in the car together. Maybe, maybe David was there, maybe he wasn't. He was. He was. But we heard you kind of sharing your BS, your belief system. You were going to go speak somewhere. Yeah, in Canada. You were going to go speak in Canada. That's right. And check this out, folks. This is how it happens. If you if you get around us, watch out, okay? Because Mike said, you know, I wish I had something to sell after I spoke or something like that, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's tell people the story. Well, I mean, it was just I was going filling in for a friend of mine in Canada, and it was a last minute thing. I was going out there, and I had forty five minutes a presentation of time allotted in this conference and and I said gee when I get done it would be nice to be able to continue a conversation and, and hopefully maybe uh, make some uh, compensation out of this whole trip and Carrie said well have you asked permission to share uh, a product at the end and I said well really no and by the way Kerry was doing this as he was driving the car <laughs> talking with his hands that is true <laughs> that is true <laughs> so anyway I was scared to death so I had to listen to what he had to say <laughs> but anyway and so when I got back home uh, called the conference organizer and said look uh, there is much more I would like to tell these guys but I won't have time is it okay if I share some ways they can connect with me later so that I might continue our conversation, our dialogue. And he said, sure. And that's how it worked. And I went to Canada and did 45 minutes. And I said, oh, by the way, I, I couldn't cover everything you needed to hear. So if anybody's interested uh, in continuing the conversation, I have a program that may help you. And boom, I got, the first guy walks up, dropped his credit card on the table and said, I'm in. I'm in, I like that, I like that. Listen, and now here he is, four years later, five years later, and he said to me just today that you transitioned your CPA business, correct, into a place now where you're essentially gonna be fully able to do your passion. Exactly right. I love it. Yeah. So, and, and how many years were you, were you in the CPA business? Almost 40. Almost 40 years. Yeah. I, I turned 41 this week. 
I know. <laughs> See, with that hair, he looks 60. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I like that. I like that. Good guy. Good guy. So, I love that, though, Mike, because in the movie The Shawshank Redemption, do you guys know how long it took Andy to break free? Remember that? 19 years. 19 years. And he could have had naysayers. He could have had people say, you know, why are you digging against the wall? Come on, man, give up on your dream. Mike's been scraping against that wall, still doing amazing things. You did that one year where you spoke how many times when you traveled? Remember that? Oh, last, oh there was two years in a row I was in, oh my God, 40 different places. 40 in different Ohio. places in, a, in Ohio speaking. 40 conferences. Yeah. 40 conferences. So again, you know, some of us have to build the dream on the side. In fact, that's a smart strategy. It's called a side hustle, right? A side hustle. All right, let's keep going. You guys ready? You ready to learn some more? Yes. You guys with me? Yes. All right, are you, some of you are thinking about Christmas and Santa. I can just see it in your face, all right? Not yet, not yet. You got time here. All right, discover your target, your target audience. I talked about Erica. Here's Erica. You spoke in March. And then they, they loved you so much, they said they brought you back in May for Mother's Day. Ordered 50 more copies. Fantastic. Again, never happened to me. I don't know why, but maybe it's the lack of hair. Mike, I don't know. <laughs> but listen, here's you only write your book for one person. You ready? This is a big secret. Nobody knows about this. Not many. You write your book for one person. And here's why. If you write your book to a group of people, it's gonna come off very inauthentic. You're gonna come off very pious, and you're gonna, you're gonna be writing like, you guys should do this, you people should do this, you, you know, and you're gonna start talking at people. Does anyone like books where you feel like the dude's up here and they're talking at you as us lowly people who are ignorant, who don't understand things? Does that, does that feel good? Not at all. No, not at all. All right. Listen, here's who you write your book to. Your former stuck self. Your former stuck self. This is true with nonfiction books. Now we'll get into fiction books in a moment. I have some fiction books over here. There's a different strategy for fiction. But here's what I know. That nonfiction, you wanna write to your former stuck self. Why would I say that? Glenn, I believe you're a psychologist and you just joined our author program. Um, why would I, I don't even know what you're gonna say, but why do you think I would say that? Try to analyze me for a moment. Why would I say right to my former stuck self? Uh, why would you do that? Yeah, why would I write in that kind of heartbeat because that ultimately tone? if you're trying to heal yourself, you're gonna heal others. Ooh, process. I like that. I like that. I wasn't even thinking that. If I'm trying to heal myself, then you'll heal others. Then I'll heal others. I like that. Look folks, when I wrote your secret name. I was not fully healed from my self-injury. I mean, I wasn't doing the activity of self-injury anymore, but I still struggled with the imposter syndrome. Glenn, you knew me back then. I was a pastor at a church, and nobody knew about my past. And let me tell you, when I got kind of a knock on the door of my heart, you should write a book about your self-injury, what do you guys think I did? Oh yeah, sign me up. What do you think? I said, no way. I said, absolutely no way. I probably swore in there too a little bit. But I said, no way am I going to write a book about how I struggled with identity and it specifically manifested itself through self-injury, cutting. No way. Up until then, I only wrote safe books about you know theology and culture and all this stuff. Stuff I could kind of keep away. Did, did many people read those books? What do you think? No. Did many people read those first books? No. A lot of people read this book. Here's the challenge I have for you guys. Your pain, you've heard me say this before, some of you who've hung around me long enough. The area of your deepest wound is often the area of your biggest contribution. The area of your deepest pain, your deepest wound, is often gonna be the area of your biggest contribution in the world. True? What do you guys think? I agree. So here's a picture of me when I was self-injuring, back when I had hair, all right? So, a little bit of hair, not much. But the point is this, that's who I wrote the book to. 
And I know that person, and you know your person. So stop thinking, well, you know, I just, I just can't get my words out. Yeah, you can. You know your story, you know your struggle, you know what you were stuck with, so start writing empathetically to that person. So Adam could actually write a book, you know, about Vision Spark and how they hire for the right company because he knows what it was like to not be in the right company and the pressures it was on his family, right? Susan, right, had health struggles and now like, wow, I saw pictures on Facebook and you got quite an amazing adventure and journey. She knows what it was like to not be able to say no to, I know your story, but to food, right? Addictions in that way. Renee's writing a book on comparing, you see? Joel, I know you're probably working on a book one of these days on media relations, because he knows the pain of not being able to get interviewed. Brian, vision and blind spots. He took his struggle of physical blindness and said, metaphorically, most of us have blind spots in life. You see how this can happen? Fantastic. Uh, my next book, Day Job to Dream Job. Who did I write that book to? The guy who had a plastic smile at, at the church, right? Who was stuck in his day job. My life wasn't horrible, I wasn't a fraud, but I was only 80% alive. And so I know that I could write a book for the 86% of the population who feels trapped in their day job. Okay, write this down. If three people have asked you how to do something, you have a book on that topic. Did you hear that? If three people have asked you how to do something on a certain topic, you have a book in you on that topic. Now, here's why. I'm gonna ask you, why? You guys tell me, why? What do you think? If three people have asked you how to do something, why do you think that's a book? They look at you as knowledgeable in the area. Okay, so you're knowledgeable, Jeff. They have questions, so everybody else does. So there's a need, you have an ability. You see what I'm saying? Excellent, I love it. All right, now some of you are saying, I know what you're saying, but Carrie, I haven't solved the problem in my own life. Come on, let's be honest, right? Some of us. Do you think I had it all figured out when I wrote your secret name? What do you think? Absolutely not. God used that book in my life to actually heal greater ways. Trust me, when you're on the 700 Club and you're speaking on nationally, internationally syndicated TV about, about your self-injury, you're gonna have to get some healing there before you step on stage, right? You got a question, Pat? No, I was just gonna say that it was my book, there are five parts. Yes. And so every night before I turn the light off, right. You read a part. You're reading your own book. And I get to part five, I start over. I love it. Because it really is written to me. I love it. To heal me. I love it. So she's written her book to heal herself. Like, that's amazing. Mike. Those conferences I talked about. Yeah. One of them was, here is, here, uh, join with me in, in my personal development journey. I'm still on it. There you go. And I'm looking for people to come with me. And here's I love what it. I, here's what I know. I love it. So it, we're going to talk about that right now. In fact, there's three styles of books. Okay. Now I'm going to just take, I'm going to stop here. I want to hear about all the fiction people in the room, uh, online. Ask, ask Erica if there's any fiction people or, um, I'm going to talk about a few other genres here. And then we'll get into nonfiction on the screen. But look, here's a fiction book. I love it. It's called A Doorway Back to Forever by Nanette, one of our tribe members. This is the second book in her series. So she's writing eight children's books. And these books are fantastic. They have all the elements of a great young adult fiction book, but it's got, you know, some some superpowers and self-limiting beliefs by the characters. I mean, classic. Chronicles of Narnia, you know, metaphor and stuff like that. But anyways, she can still put herself in the book. Isn't this true? Right? Aren't we just grown-up kids? Mm -hmm. So when Nanette writes a book, it still struggles with loyalty, betrayal, self-limiting beliefs, <clears throat> the reluctant hero. 
So you can put so many elements from life in here and even experience some healing as well. Here's one of our children's authors. I mean, look at this book is amazing, right? I mean, look at the quality. And this book's all about the transformation of a, what is it called? A caterpillar, thank you very much, uh, into, into a butterfly. And I mean, the pages look, you know, look beautiful. And it's just a story that helps kids think that I am more than my current reality, see? And then we even have a fantastic, I call it a coffee table book. She gets very mad when I say that. Um, she's corrected me many times publicly. But anyways, whatever book you call this, uh, but it's the Emanuel Quilt, and I mean, just fantastic. And it's her journey about uh, really making this legit quilt that tells the story of redemption. So you can do this with other genres, but I'm gonna give you guys a nonfiction tip here, okay? You guys with me, you hanging? Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the three styles. Because Rob, Rob's in the room. You could write a book about any one of these three that I'm talking about. You could write about The Struggler. If you want an example of a book written from a struggler perspective, write down Blue Like Jazz. Blue Like Jazz was Donald Miller's first legit book. Today he's doing all kinds of stuff with story brand and all this stuff, but he wrote a book called Blue Like Jazz that said, I grew up in the church and I don't get it. And I don't get this whole thing of religion and God, and I'm gonna just write really authentically about how I have struggles, about what I've been told. When he wrote that book, oh my gosh. Did anyone ever hear that book, by the way? You've heard of that book, Brenda, mm -hmm. Rob, Adam. Adam, it was probably published, you're probably younger than me, but I know I was kinda like in my young 20s when that book came out, and, and at least my friends in my generation just latched onto it, and they're like, Wow, finally someone's putting words to what I'm thinking. And what you do as a struggler book is you don't say, I have all the answers. You don't say, hey, I figured this thing out. It's a framework, how to dissect God, and I'll show you how to do it, right? It's, it's a guy or a girl saying, you know what? I'm a mom of an autistic kid, and I'm struggling to death. And let's help figure this thing out together, okay? Erica's book, uh, you, you Taught My Feet How to Dance. I mean, you kind of brought ladies in, correct? I won't put words in your mouth, but you brought ladies in to your struggle and you offer a solution in the process, but you don't position it as, I've arrived and I found out this magic trick, okay? Is that hope for everybody in the room? Can everybody write at least a book on a struggle sure. perspective? If you can't, I'll give you some of my struggles. Okay. All right. Can everybody write a book on struggling? Okay. So everybody has a struggle in the room. Okay. Just check it. I mean, even it could be a struggle like, um, like ridiculous stuff. Like how to use word, how to use Excel. Have, are there book, the dummy series. Okay. Philosophy for dummies. I bought that book by the way. Okay. Sometimes I buy those books just because I like the basics, right? Awesome, here's another perspective, Sherpa. This is what I think Mike was saying. The Sherpa says, it's like Pat's book, Language of Heaven. I did struggle, but I found a shortcut. And I want you to come along with me and I'll show you the fastest way up the mountain. Isn't that cool? There's a ton of books like that. In fact, that's how I write my books. My books is, you know what, I was stuck in my day job. It was killing me. Um, I found a shortcut, here's nine steps, and come with me and I'll save you some time and money and pain. That's how I, that's how I write all my, all my books, is I take on the Sherpa perspective. And then I have a course tied to it, then I have a keynote speech tied to it, then I have a retreat and a conference, right? All this stuff. Next one, Sage, Sage. Who's somebody who's uh, written a book like that is a perceived sage? Yeah, I was a registered dietitian. You were a registered dietitian? And this is a former life. Okay. Like two lives ago, actually. Yeah. And um, I worked with people who could be heavily fed by being and by two. Wow. And I was involved in research. Okay. I couldn't, it was all insecure work. And so I co-authored a book on total parental and adult nutrition. 
excellent. Some of you are sages in the room. You absolutely are. Pete Gano, music. I mean, college professor at three different universities. Two. Well, you got grad school three. Three. So he could write a book on all kinds of things related to the music. Uh, what do you call it? Music area? Music, I don't know. Music history. Music history, all that stuff. You were my fine arts teacher in college, right? Yes. I was awake. It was good. I was good. I learned a lot of stuff. I, I learned a lot of stuff. I learned a lot of stuff. Never fell asleep once. All right? Very good teacher. But Tony Robbins, Tony Robbins, Oprah, all these people, they position themselves as a sage. Anytime someone puts their face on the cover, typically, not all the time, but 99.9%, .9%, they're writing their book as a sage. Not all the time, but most of the time, okay? Anyone find this helpful? The three, three types of um, tones your book can have, all right? Find the right time to finish your book. Find the right time, excellent. All right, let's talk about that. Ooh, this is good, this is good, you ready? This is good, this will help you in work, life, relationships, all that stuff. Work will expand to fill the time available for its completion. Brenda, you agree? <laughs> Brenda agrees. This means that if your college professor gave you an assignment on day one, very few people would get that thing done in the next 48 hours, right? Even though it probably only took 48 hours to complete, when is 99% of the people gonna complete it? The night before. The night before, <laughs> two nights before, absolutely. Now. Here's what the problem is. If you operate your life that way, you will not be successful. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. It's always in your subconscious brain. The day Pete Gano assigned it, even if it's not in my conscious memory, like I'm thinking about it every day, subconsciously, I'm thinking about it. Which means, and this is Elixir Project experience stuff, which David and I are gonna talk about next week. We have some exciting stuff with uh, a January 18 Elixir Project thing. But listen, this means that all of your subconscious power that you know your brain has, which is literally four billion bits of information per second. Did you catch that? The average mind can only think about consciously 120 to 200 bits of information a second. This means that if Joel's up here and if Jeff's up here and they're both talking to me at the same time, my brain is gonna miss out parts of both of their conversations. Have you ever told this with multiple kids? Kids, daddy needs to think. All right, you go first and then I'll take care of you, right? Moms, I get it, you're, you're slick, you can do that. Um, but, right? I mean. This is true. You say, oh, I can multitask. The reality is, yeah, you can multitask non-cognitive things, like mowing the lawn, which is an autopilot for your muscles, and listening to an audiobook. That is not two cognitive things. But if you try to listen to a conference call intelligently, and check your emails, and write a book, your IQ goes down 40%, it's worse than being stoned, okay? We call this switch tasking. What you're doing is you're doing switch tasking. Check it out. Time, time, you have time to write your book. I mean, let's just take the, the, the basics of m math. The average nonfiction book, 40,000 words. The average person writes 500 words an hour. The average person could write a nonfiction book in how many hours? 80. Okay, one hour a day, 80 days in a row, there's your nonfiction book. Now, we don't do that. We say, oh my gosh, I know I should be writing right now, but Netflix is calling my name, okay? <laughs> or the football game. And then we try to write while we're watching the football game and we struggle with 100 words that took four hours. True? Come on, let's be honest, right? This is called Parkinson's Law. Parkinson's Law, the amount of time which one has to perform a task is the amount of time it will take to complete the task. This means if I told Glenn, you got 30 days to write that book. Pat, you know this. You raised your hand at a fellowship 
a few months ago and you said, Carrie, I'm going on several years. I need to get this book done. And you remember what I told you? I probably got in trouble with Pete. I said, I said, stop going to church. Ooh, you should never say that. Um, I said, stop taking calls. Stop meeting with people. And she did it. She even stopped coming to the fellowship. Ouch. But I was like, all right, she's doing it. And did it work? Absolutely. It worked. In other words, focus means one thing. If you truly devote 30 days, 60 days, 90 days to write your book, I'm not into hype stuff. I see stuff on the internet, write your book in one weekend. Okay, it's going to be a bad book. All right, I'll just, let's just be honest. I don't treat, I don't have gimmicks. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if you truly make that your priority and your focus and not take lunch appointments and not check the internet and all this stuff, you can get it done. This means that if you have a limited amount of time, your effort's gonna go through the roof. If you have a long amount of time, it's gonna be chronic pain, right? You want acute pain or chronic pain? I know that for me to write a book, when I'm in book mode, it's some acute pain. But the, the benefits and the doors it opens, no one can take that away from you. When you're an author, you have entered a new class of people. And you are an author and no one can take that from you. You have a eternal asset that you've created. It's fantastic. Uh, true story, I'll go through this really quick. I mentioned Elixir Project Experience. I know it's tough to read this, Brenda, but this says October 9th, 2014. That's a note in my phone. I woke up in the middle of the night, had this idea. I'm gonna write a young adult fiction book. Guess how long it took me? A very long time, because I kept thinking about it. Well, you know, who am I to write fiction? Well, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know when it got real? When I found an editor, and she's like, it's gonna take me this long, and you're gonna have to pay this much, and you have to deliver it this day, and then I pushed back. Because again, I might be a coach, but I'm also human, right? So I pushed back and I said, hey, I want the book in hand at the Igniting Souls Conference 2016, and I pushed back and I said, hey, what happens if I miss the deadline, right? Because I, do we do this as people? I'm like, I know your deadline, but what happens if I miss the deadline? Look, we are crazy people. We argue for what we don't want, right? Write that down. Am I arguing for what I don't want in my life? Some of us are saying, I want, you know, the perfect man or the perfect lady, or I, I want the perfect business, and then we argue against what we want. I said I want the perfect editor, I found her, her name's Julie, and then she said I'm willing to take your project, she doesn't take a lot of projects, and here's the deadline, and I say, but what happens if I miss the deadline? She says, then you lose half your money that you put in front, and I don't edit your book, and you lose your place in line. <laughs> Guess what happened after I signed the form on March 23rd, 2016? You think I made the deadline? Oh, yeah. I absolutely made the deadline. Because I paid time, I paid money, the conference was on the line. Some of you don't have a big enough cost. To you, a book is negotiable. You're saying, eh, maybe. If you knew your child or your niece or your nephew was being held hostage, in Europe right now, and you could not see them ever again unless you had $70,000 in 72 hours and you had to meet them in Europe, do you think he would be there? Anybody? Would you be there with $70,000? Absolutely. Even if you didn't have a passport? Absolutely. Even if you didn't have the money? Absolutely. Absolutely you would. Your brain would go on creative mode and you would somehow figure out something to, to, to find and save your child or your niece or your nephew. Why? Because your why is big enough. You don't have a big enough why, some of you, to write a book. You don't. Just be honest. A book is like, eh, it's like a yard, you know, a lawn. Everyone has one. I want a lawn. I want a book, right? If you don't have a big enough why about what your book's going to do for people, how it's going to change people's lives, I do this little exercise, you can write it down, 
you can copy it. It's called Fictitious Follower Imaginary Impact. Fictitious Follower Imaginary Impact. This is how I write all my books. I sit down and I say, Dear Carrie, I read your book and it changed my life. Let me tell you the story. And I make up a letter. I absolutely make up a letter. Fictitious follower, imaginary impact. I write an imaginary letter to myself saying, Dear, dear Glenn, dear Renee, dear Brian, dear Kathy, I read your book. We've never met, but it changed my life. Here's my story. When you get that story in clarity and then print it out, put it on your computer, on your bathroom wall, now, instead of watching Netflix, you're like, if I don't finish this book, Billy's going to die. Okay? You see what I'm saying? Right? Julie's going to live in a self-limiting belief prison. See, now, now you've created a why. Is this helpful? Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. We got to go quick here. We're going quick. A proven model for publishing the right way. Get your book into Barnes and Noble stores, earn the most profit, and distribute around the world. Anybody know who this is? Yeah, Cardiff. Cardiff. Cardiff Hall. Ty Turner's book, right? He got his book into Barnes and Noble like many of our people. Here's Eric. This is cool. I See, again, students outperform me all the time. This guy got one. It says uh, from a bookstore, uh, I'm down to one copy, please send or bring in more. How cool would that be to have bookstores sending you letters and saying, we're all out, please send more. Pretty cool, hey? Here's him signing in Colorado at, at his book signing, next to his favorite big author. Here's a fiction author, right? And there's Deborah Hayes and S.G. Savage, and this is in Denver, never been there. Anybody ever been there, the tattered? Uh, cover bookstore. It's like three levels. I want to go there. I will go there someday. It has everything to do with your ISBN. It has everything to do with your ISBN. Listen, the reason why I'm teaching this today, no, no secret, at the end I'm going to say, look, if you want to do a book the right way, we'll show you how. Now, we can't take everybody. Um, we just did a webinar this week with 4,000 people that are going to be watching the live or the replay, we only take 25, hundreds apply. But the point is this, if you're gonna do the work, you might as well give it the best chance of success, right? I've always thought that. If I'm gonna do something, I want it to go big. That's kinda how I roll. So most people do not know that, hey, if I publish with CreateSpace, which is like the new way to publish, your book will never be in a bookstore. Why is that? Because they don't allow returns. They don't allow returns. Jeff Bezos, smart guy. I mean, come on, right? Smart guy, billi billionaire, many times over, right? I don't know. Here's the thing, he's smart. He says, we want to be the main distributor of your book. We don't want anybody else getting any share of it. So if you publish with CreateSpace and you try to go into a Barnes & Noble and say, hey, can you shelve my book? Can I come in for a book signing? They scan the UPC and it says, create space. And then they say, no, we can't. Because if we order those books and if they don't sell, like it's true for every book, okay? Stephen King, everybody, everybody. This is how bookstores work. Bookstores buy the book, they shelve it, and if it doesn't sell after a few months, or they return it. And then they can still operate and still pay their managers and light and heat. With create space books, they can't do that. So they say, no, we, we can't carry that. Another thing is, if you don't know the tricks, like on your ISBN, it gives them a wholesale discount. Bookstores are not gonna carry your book if they don't get a profit. And yet so many people, they don't know this stuff. They put all this time and energy into writing a book and then they say, great, you know, let's go to Barnes & Noble and get my book. Oh, you can't. How, how disappointing would that be? Yet it's true for many, many people because they don't know the system. And then your book has to be priced correctly, where it's not underpriced, where you're not making anything because then you'd have to pay them to, to carry it. But it's not priced too much where they don't get a nice profit as well. So these are the things that we help our authors do. Check this out. <clears throat> Tomorrow, two of our authors, December 9th, are in Barnes & Noble in Missouri. So they're doing their book signing. 
This is uh, Mary Baloney and, and Shelley. Okay, fiction, nonfiction. Sage, catch it, you see it? See, now you guys know. Sage, why is that a sage book? Pictures on the cover, right? And then fiction book. They're both doing a, Bar a Barnes & Noble book signing in Missouri. Check it out, Monday, two of our other authors, Deborah Hayes and Lisa Thompson. Lisa Mosier, that's her maiden name. Um, Barnes & Noble, in where? Where's that at? Kentucky. So again, our authors, we show them how to do this, how to get into the largest bookstores in the world and do book signings. And they're speaking too. This isn't just like little table over here. They're speaking. It's fantastic. Uh, here's Linda, December 2nd, like last week. That's who the other one was. No? She launched a long time ago, but she just did a book signing, speaking. And if you can't tell, she's excited. Okay? <laughs> so in the business section, we do all kinds of books. She's excited. I mean, that was cool. She got clients out of the process, speaking engagements. They feature you all over the internet as come hear this author. Very cool things. Here's something. This was a shocker even to me, and I can't be shocked that much, right? We were able to get these five authors, Vietnamese publishers, to pick them up. So now their book is not only just going to English, Vietnamese. Pretty cool, hey? Eh? So every one of our authors now gets a foreign publishing representation where they might be picked up in German, French, all kinds of things. Here's uh, Amy, who just got her book in Turkish. Don't ask me what any of those words mean, okay? <laughs> but um, I guess that's, that's what that means, cool. So, all right, you guys ready for the last step? And then we'll do Q&A. Last step and then Q&A, cool? You guys ready, you hanging? All right, how do you do a podcast, blog, and media tour? David, I'm gonna ask you to come up here for a second and. You know as well as I do, back when we started our dream together um, as Redeem the Day, Igniting Souls, all this stuff, we didn't even have book publishing on the radar, did we? No. Um, what is, as someone who's kind of seen it, built it, um, what have, how have you felt about these authors and like, how, what, what doors has it opened? Oh, this is one of the coolest things that we do, is we get to see all these people come to us with the ideas on their heart and the dreams and the things that are inside of them, and now we see all these little, it's like little trees growing up all along the landscape. They're growing up, they're digging their roots in, they're taking the stand for what they believe and what, they, what they're all about, and they're building it out, and there's all sorts of benefits coming from all this. It's really awesome. cool to watch all these people, because they're getting it. And it's coming piece by piece, step by step, and it's all coming. We just got to keep going and walking the journey with them. Yeah. Pretty crazy that he got a $3,000 honorarium. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's very cool. That's awesome, man. Congrats. Thanks. And let's give Dave a hand because he, he helped build, you know, the infrastructure for Author Academy Elite. So thank you. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. How to do a podcast tour, all these fantastic things. <clears throat> Look, I love to coach people. When I knew that Mel was gonna do a book on her topic, Dare to be Raw, I said, I said Mel, again, because I coach, I coach our authors for up to 18 months, all about their um, author journey. You know, David coaches people about the business building, the funnels, the Facebook ads, the membership sites, all that. But I coach people on their author journey, the marketing. I say, look, put tape over your mouth, have these cue cards, I did a screenshot at 16,000 views, you know, on her launch day about, look, this video was powerful. I mean, it went, uh, just here it was 81 shares, and again, I just took it when it first came out, but fantastic things. Um, Joan, when our authors launch, we show them how to launch. When Joan launched, she said, I hit 50 reviews on my launch day Thank you so much. And again, we show her how to do social media. She was not a social media guru, but we show her how to use social media in a way that tells stories. Write this down. You've heard me say it if you're uh, an oldie, but goodie. Um, uh, selling is serving and marketing is storytelling. Selling is serving and marketing is storytelling. 
So we tell Joan, don't just go online and be like, hey, my book came out. Go buy it. That's so lame. Nobody likes that post. You're gonna get haters. Instead, look at this, 215 likes. She tells a story, and we help our authors do this. Again, launched in an incredible way. Here's a cool one. I mean, we have some crazy rock stars in our author group. I mean, anytime Tony Robbins calls you and is like, hey, I'm gonna put you on my page with three million likes and put your picture on there. Amy, one of our authors, she taught his business mastery class on how to do her skill, right? And uh, we got people who are being invited to their alma maters and being the keynote speakers and talking about their books. Here's Derek Deprey. This dude is speaking all the time. Every time I look at his Facebook page, he's just speaking about his book, speaking about his book, getting his book out there. Um, I love what Terry says. She says, I love the Author Academy Elite process. It's not based on gimmicks. This is not based on gimmicks. If you wanna be a guaranteed New York Times bestseller, I'll show you who to call and they'll take $250,000 and it will wreck your career and it's all artificial and you'll be blackballed. That's not what I teach. I teach real stuff that is work, but it works. She says, as a mom writing on homeschooling, I didn't have high expectations for endorsements or opportunities. But now I have a foreword by an actress. I have endorsements from the CEO of Praxis. I don't even know what that is. The president of something or other textbook company. I have two webinars scheduled, and today I am providing Facebook Live video for a political website with three and a half million likes. Crazy stuff. Little homeschool mom, right? Self limiting beliefs. Who are you? What can you do? There it is. Uh, I love this guy too. Look, our system, our model, Jim Akers, he sold four times more books in three weeks than the average book sells in 12 months. Traditionally published, like the big dogs. Um, Jim's fantastic. He got a number one uh, new release. Here's a post he did that said, hey, I just signed 85 books, I'm speaking, and uh, I just got back three weeks ago from Texas, and I've gotten uh, four, no, three four-figure honorariums for speaking. So there you gotta chase them now, okay? Yeah, but But Jim, Jim, Jim was retired. He doesn't know social media. He launched with 455 people on his launch team. We teach you everything related to writing, publishing, and launching. Look, even if you don't decide to apply at the end, you need a launch team. You need a launch party, all right? A book without a birthday is just wrong, okay? Your book needs a birthday. Events spike traffic. You might say, well, Carrie, I don't have anybody. I don't know anybody. Pat, you know, you're gonna Facebook live stream your launch. Like, like we teach. You'll get hundreds of views and hundreds and probably thousands. I just got this text this week. Aaron and I had a great night at our public local launch. We sold over $2,700 worth of books. That wasn't even their global launch. That was just small little town stuff and $2,700 in books. Cool stuff. Um, we did have a webinar this week. I don't put my face on there because no one would click. Okay, it's <laughs> being real, it's being real. Anyway, um, here's the point, folks. Today, if you got a story in you, and I know a lot of you already are authors, a lot of you are in process, maybe I'm just talking to the people online, but I know that if you want 2018 to be different than any other year you've ever done, write and publish a book. Do it the right way and when you build a business around it, it literally opens doors. Here's uh, our 46 authors that we launched in October. How many of you were there in the room? Anybody? Bunch of you. Fantastic. I mean, these people are from all over the world, and uh, I'm not going to show you the trailer yet because it's a surprise, but we just had um, my buddy Chris finish the trailer for the conference. It's crazy awesome. 
Um, he's worked, right now he's working for Google, Nickelodeon. He's done things with uh, Game of Thrones. He's, he, he's out there doing MTV, like crazy cool videos. He, he did our video for our next year's conference, Close the Gap. Each one of our authors gets to speak at the conference. We have something special this year called the Red Carpet Sessions, and we have the Author Academy Awards. So we've already booked it. It's at the Hilton Polaris, if you're uh, local. But why not write your book, launch your book, and be there with us uh, doing it in the Author Academy Awards. So I'm gonna do some Q&A. We got a few minutes. Anything's fair game. You can ask me anything related to writing, publishing, marketing. Um, if you got business building questions, I'll, I'll ask David to come up. Pat's got one already, so hang with me. Let me just say this. Once in a while, we open up a new group of authors. Because we published 46 uh, last October, just a few months ago, we have some open spots, and you need to apply. So Erica, if you can put in the um, link in the live stream. Brian, if you could pass these out. I know half the people in the room are already our authors, but if anybody says, you know what, I'm just even interested in looking at the application, just raise your hand, and we're gonna basically um, take 25 people. So Daphne's doing interviews all day today. Mickey's doing interviews to, uh, Sunday. Um, we've had hundreds apply and we can only take 25. We literally talk to everybody, okay? Everybody who's a fit, potentially, we talk with them. There's no commitment. You just put in your topic, your goals, your fears, and then do you have access to, to finances to invest in this uh, career, author career? It's ridiculously lower than anything that is out there, okay? So I'm gonna do questions in just a moment. Um, Pat, you have the first question. Go for it. Anything related to writing, publishing, marketing? Well, I'd like to know, um, I know you have a committee for choosing what? the- Why don't you come up? Because I just want the people on the, the live stream to be able to see and hear you. So if anybody's got a question, come on up. Yeah, you said we got a committee that's gonna, um, I understand you have a committee to yeah. choose the awards. Yeah, can I talk about that? That's exciting. Yeah. And would you give how to be on that committee? Sure. And then what do I need to be on the award? Yeah, fantastic, great question. Very good. So here, David knows this, this is super cool. We have, um, we're not doing American Idol, okay? We don't have Randy Jackson and Simon and all that, but we do have some rock stars in the publishing world. We have one of the most um, downloaded podcasters, Jeff Brown, who read to lead. You think that's a good fit? Read to lead? Read to lead podcast. He's the guy that Seth Godin calls, John Maxwell calls. Anybody who's really big calls him and says, can I get on your podcast? Jeff Brown is a judge uh, for the Author Academy Awards. So he's gonna be one of our judges. I've also talked with my close friend and uh, amazing literary agent. So we're gonna have a New York literary agent who's a judge, Rochelle Gardner. She's fantastic. She's gonna be a judge. Um, I'm still working on the other judges. I've got, uh, the, the contact has been made, but we're gonna have a, a panel of amazing judges, all right? David and his entire team are building the website right now. Nominations will begin on January 1st. They will end in August. The winning prize is uh, stage time at the main event. Um, it is to, to be mentioned on the Read to Lead podcast. It's a private small group session with a YouTube celebrity who's gonna teach you how to optimize YouTube for your own career, um, your own author career. There's a few other things that are in there as well. It's all at ignitingsoulsconference.com. If you click authors, it lays it all out. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. I will be 
creating a committee to help me implement some of the uh, system and process for the Author Academy Awards. We're gonna accept uh, people from the public. We are gonna receive traditional publishing submissions, indie submission, which, which means self-publishing, and Author Academy Elite. So we're not just saying, ooh, this event's just for little Author Academy Elite, and the whole big world out there is not going to be invited. We're inviting authors to this event. It's going to be a red carpet event. It's going to be at the Hilton Polaris. Um, we have a VIP author dinner. I mean, all the details are at ignitingsoulsconference.com. It's going to be a night to remember. It really is. Joel and I are meeting after today. Joel is our uh, publicist, PR, what's the right term? All of Joel is going to be uh, shouldering with me this event to get it in front of media. Uh, I mean, we're serious. This is going to be a real special event. We knew that um, we got something special in Author Academy Elite, and we want to take that to the world, and we're going to make this a very cool industry uh, precedent-setting event. So submissions right now. You can't submit your book yet because we're building a whole um, nomination process. Anybody can be submitted, uh, but there's a vetting process. In other words, I don't want to give an award for 51 Shades of Grey. Okay, I just that's my personal. Hey, I can make that decision. So there's certain books that aren't going to make it. You know, How to Build a Bomb and Kill People. We're not going to do that book either. Um, so there are there are certain submissions. But we're gonna have, a, I think, 16 genres. So this is like business, medicine, uh, children's fiction, religion, um, inspiration. We have all these genres that are gonna be able to apply, okay? So more details will come, and uh, I will be opening up uh, committee applications as well soon, okay? Other questions, comments about writing, publishing, marketing, turning it into a business, any of that stuff. Becky. I have a question about, um, if you want to just do a digital book. If you just want to do a digital book. I'm just repeating for the online people. Yeah. Kindle, well, you have to do Kindle to do an audio book, but if you just want to do a Kindle, not a hardback, yeah. do you have to go through create space for that? Or yeah, that's a great question. Look, am I against e-books? I'm not against e-books. When we do a book with Author Academy Elite, we do five versions. We do hardcover, softcover, ebook, audio, if they read it, if not, we'll pair them up, and EPUB. EPUB gets you on iTunes for iBooks, Nook, Barnes and Noble Readers, those types of things. I'm not against ebooks only, but here's what you've never heard. You've never heard someone stand on stage and say, Thanks for bringing me here today to speak. I'll be signing ebooks in the back. <laughs> Just bring your smartphone. You know, just give me a Sharpie. I'll Look, there's a certain credibility that comes with a physical book. There is a physical book where you hold it, you, you touch it, you know, all this stuff. There's a credibility to that. If people say, you know, you're a published author and you say, oh, I'm on Amazon. They say, great, you know, I like to buy a book. And then they go there and it's just an ebook. I'm not saying it's bad. But I'm saying it's you're going to be missing out on a lot of influence, impact, and income. I tell people take all five. I publish in all five ways on purpose. Audiobooks is one of the fastest growing publishing platforms right now, and I know you know that because you're a narrator. Every smartphone is an audiobook player. The average person commutes enough in three years to earn a PhD in a subject matter if they were listening to audiobooks. So audiobooks, ebooks, I love them all, but I, I truly do love them all. If you just want to publish an ebook, it's free. Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP, KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. It's not bad. Um, my passion and David's passion is to help people build businesses around their books. And the amount of people who've built a business around their ebook, very rare. Very rare. Yeah. Cool, and I mean, just take Brian as an example. You know, you sold 50 books at your last event, roughly. Mm -hmm. That would not have happened with eBooks, okay? Just from a transaction perspective, okay? Other questions, great, great questions, comments. 
New people you can ask a question to. You don't need to stand up on stage. I'll repeat your question from the floor. Anybody have any other questions? Writing, publishing, coaching, anything. Erica, any questions online? Um, I love people to just type in a question that they have online. That would be fantastic. Pat, you have another one. For an audiobook. So the neat thing with an audiobook is you get assigned. Uh, I'm going to suggest everyone do Audible. Audible is the number one site for audiobooks. It's bundled with your Amazon. Like when it, you, you guys know, when you go to Amazon, you'll see a person's physical book, then you'll see the audiobook if it's on Audible. The other cool thing with Audible, a lot of people don't know this you get what's called a bounty. If your book is the first book that somebody gets for free, actually, in a subscription, you get an extra $50. It's called a bounty. So your audiobook, I get this you know, every month, that if my book was the first in their Audible subscription, and Audible's smart, they'd give you your first two audiobooks free. So you can use that as marketing. You can say, hey guys, hey friends, family, uh, my book's on Audible right now. You can grab it free. Just click this link. If they click your link, get their two audiobooks free, you get an extra $50 plus your royalty just because it's a bounty program. Okay? Super smart. So you don't need your own ISBN for Audible. And your ebook, you do with certain ebook providers. I, I books makes you get an uh, ISBN. We buy all that for you. You're one of our students. Your tuition covers everything. Cover design, interior design, editing your proposal in chapter one, ticket to the conference, you know, you know, as one of our students, you get you get it all. Awesome. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Erica, yes, from the online people. Marla Denton asks, do you get your copyright in advance? If so, should it be through Library of Congress? So Library of Congress, there's a little trick with the Library of Congress that you need to get it at the right time, okay? And we get all of our, our uh, people, their Library of Congress. So, um, say the question one more time. Do you get your copyright in advance? So, what you do is you, you file your book to get a Library of Congress number. And you'll, you'll notice that in our books, as in most books uh, that are done the right way, it'll have the Library of Congress number right in the front pages. And we use an interior designer who puts that right in there uh, after. So it's a timing thing. I can help her offline. It's kind of a complicated process. But we handle all that with our authors. Great question. Anybody else? Erica on the Facebook? Anybody else here? Okay. So let me just say in our last five minutes, it was a blessing to serve you guys today. I hope you learned a ton. Did anybody learn anything? Raise your hand if you learned anything. Because if you didn't, I'm going to talk with you for five more minutes and teach you something. Okay? <laughs> so you all learned something. Um, make, make these next three weeks count. Okay? And listen, the action takers, I'm just going to give you guys a warning. The action takers, the successful people that are out there, many of them are you, they're not waking up on January 1st and saying, you know, it's 2018. What do I want to do this next year? I mean, listen, the people that I roll with, they're already saying in 2018, like they're planning now to make 2018 the, their, their year. And the way that they're doing that is they're thinking about it now, okay? Don't do what, you know, 99% of people do, which is the Today Show's talking about, you know, New Year's resolutions, so by golly, I gotta make something. I love what Renee did when she started today. She says New Year's resolutions fail because they don't have a process attached to it. Well, today I shared with you a lot of cool stuff, and yeah, you can go figure out it all on your own, or you can hook up and be involved in a process. We call it Author Academy Lead. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you next month. If you're local, we may be at a new location. We'll let you know, and we'll be talking about some business building things next time. Thanks so much for coming. We'll see you.